cases. So reading the whole chapter is really long. So I think that's why we kind of skipped over it. But um, what happens in those in-between verses is God lays out this, um, the, the prophecy is um, a lot of really visual imagery of essentially destruction, of God like tearing things down, of mountains being flattened, of rivers um, coursing through. And it's a really vivid description, and I encourage you to go read it at some point, um, a really vivid description of the day of redemption. Um, you know, it's, again, the mountains are flattened, the deep moves. If you'll remember from um, the book of Job, the prophet Job, God says to Job, you know, where were you when I created this? And where were you when, you know, I made the, the doe have her fawn? And he also said that he's the one who told um, the deep, the ocean, this far you shall go and no further. He's the one who set up the order of the earth. But what we're reading in Habakkuk in this prophecy is, um, is really an unmaking, right? It's, it feels or it reads as like an inverse of Genesis where now the deep is moving forth. God's saying, fine, go, cover the earth. The mountains are flattened. At one point, Habakkuk said, is it the rivers that you're angry with? Because the rush of creation, the description, the imagery is so forceful. It's so um, just like, it's just full of like movement. And, you know, it says the sun and the moon stand still. And whether that's because the, you know, the, the arrows are so bright coming out of God's hand that there's no need for the sun. Or whether, I mean, it's, it almost makes you feel as though, as you read it, that the sun and the moon are almost awestruck by God's power. And so creation actually is forcefully moving, forcefully moving, and it just stands still. Like, whoa, even, even creation, which we think of um, as almost being inanimate, but it's actually like living, it, it itself is awestruck by God's movement. So it's really, it's a lot of a prophecy, but it's also um, it just, it's, it's so full of imagery. It's just, I would encourage you to go read it. Um, I'm excited about it, but you know. Um, but anyway, if you soak in the imagery, like it's so devastating in ways that it, it doesn't sound like it's much better than the tumultuous time that Habakkuk is already living in because it sounds also really violent and it sounds so strong. Um, but it's interesting that when God finally reverses the injustices of the world, when he comes with his power and his might, it's not going to be moderate. It's not going to be this incremental change that we're always encouraged to just like, we'll just slow down and we'll get to it when we get to it. And well, we can't do both of those things. We can't r fight racism and sexism at the same time. And we can't, we have to choose between. And it's just like, well, when God's justice comes, it will flatten mountains. Like it is the forcefulness. It is, um, you know, I, it's imagery, it's metaphor. Uh, but I think it speaks pretty clearly to how God feels about injustice, that he's not going to just inch towards it and do what he can with it and, you know, leave some of it lingering because it's just too much work. Rather, he is going to level it. We're going to go back down to the foundations. It will be a, um, an unmaking. It will be an unmaking of... Um, you know, again, the, the imagery is about the physical world, but he's talking about, like, the, the things he mentions are, like, people who oppress the poor, right? People who try to do so in secret. We're talking, like, financial policies and systems and tax loopholes and, like, all those things that sound kind of, like, boring and logistical, but God cares about those things, too, because that's where injustice comes from. You know, injustice is not just... Um, the things we see out in the open, it's all the things that trickle in and build on each other. And God is saying, I'm going to come through and unmake it. I'm going to level the foundations. We are going to need to start over. We're going to need to start over. Um, and then Habakkuk reacts, in a, and um, he reacts in a way that I think we would if we truly comprehended the vastness of this unmaking of how deeply and how profoundly and how strongly God cares about bringing justice to this earth. This is Habakkuk's reaction, verse 16. When I heard, my whole body trembled. My lips shook at the sound. 
Weakness overcame my limbs. My legs gave way under me. This, after he hears God's response to what he asked for, he said, come and undo this. And God says, oh, I will. And then he lays out a picture and Habakkuk goes, ooh, that made my legs shake. That was scary. That was a lot. Because God will move against injustice, but sometimes unmaking systems um, is just as hard and just as forceful as the systems themselves, right? Like there's a, the, the birth pains that come. Um, the reality says just as there is pain and oppression, there will be pain and liberation. And that made me think of Romans 8, um, which reads like this. We know that until now the whole creation has been groaning as with the pains of childbirth. And not only it, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we continue waiting eagerly to be made children of God. That is, to have our whole bodies redeemed and set free. It was in this hope that we were saved, but if we see what we hope for, it isn't hope. For all, after all, who hopes for what he already sees? But if we continue hoping for something we don't see, then we will wait eagerly for it with perseverance. So groaning with the pains of childbirth, waiting to be set free, hoping and persevering. How will we move through this holy unmaking? Will we find the calm and hope that Habakkuk found as he moved from that lament to hope, as he built up his song, his story, his sense of how he was going to move in these spaces? Um, and Habakkuk makes that transition pretty quickly. In verse 16, the one that started with my legs are trembling, it ends with, but I wait calmly for the day of trouble. I wait calmly for the day of trouble. Um, and I feel like that's, that's a dance that I think we all try to do, right? Where we feel the injustice, we see it, we don't want to hide from it, we also don't want to let it consume us, and then we're like, Overconsumption, apathy, seeing consuming everything. Oh, maybe I just need to not, or just, just let me just get away. Like, maybe I should become a hermit. Like, you just, it's, it's hard to find that balance. So when Habakkuk goes from, wow, that's terrifying, to I feel calm in the space of one verse, you're kind of left wondering. I need, I need a how-to. <laughs> like, how, how do we get to, to that space? Um, so how do we move away from being okay with the status quo to moving towards um, a sense of hope? Um, and Habakkuk lays out the things that he does. So he starts by remembering. We remember the things that God has already done. You know, I mean, we just witnessed this beautiful dance, right? Um, Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful dance. And it was, it was um, portrayed as, hey, this is a song that celebrates our strength. It celebrates our victories. It celebrates the ways that we have overcome and all the things that we have put up with and lived through and, you know, made it past. And it's beautiful. Like, we need that joy, right? We need that reminder of the ways that God has moved in our lives, our personal lives, when we've had hard days hard years, we have to remember the way that God has shown up for us in the past. And we need to go back farther and remember the way God has shown up for um, our, our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation and our great-grandparents' generation. Like, we need to remember, like, God showed up and he's been showing up and he has shown me that he is faithful. Um, how can I remember that and hold on to it? And that's what Habakkuk does. He starts off by saying, I know the deeds that you have done. He's remembering, like, I know you move. I know you're not an idol who just sits around because I've seen it and I've heard about it. And we just need to hold on to that. We need to remember that while we can be, or I'll speak for myself, I can be a very short-sighted person. Like, sometimes what I see in front of me is all I see. I'm like, you're in a hard situation and it feels like it's going to last forever. Like my current situation kind of is what it is and that's my life. And it's just like, that's not true. Like we are short-sighted creatures who serve an all-seeing God, who is not short-sighted, who is able to, like he's not bound by time. 
right? And so by remembering that, by remembering that that's who we are, but that's who he is, it gives us a sense of perspective and it really can start to foster that hope and that calm within us. And relatedly, we need to remember when and how to hold on to our peace. Um, I don't generally like to stand at the pulpit and use the word should. You should do this and you shouldn't do that. Um, but I will right now and say that we shouldn't close our eyes to injustice, but we also shouldn't try to absorb it all. And if you have tried to do that, you've probably realized that it's, it doesn't work well. Like you can't try to absorb everything and consume everything, every video, every news story, every whatever that comes across your screen or, or that you hear around and keep your sanity. You just, you can't. And I used to be annoyed when people would be like, oh yeah, I didn't watch that video because it was just too much. And I'm like, well, that's a lot of privilege that you get to just turn it off. I don't get to turn it off because this is, and then I just kept consuming and consuming and consuming and I couldn't sleep at night. And I just was like, just constantly had this pit in the bottom of my stomach. And I was just like, oh, I'm a finite creature. Like I can't keep absorbing everything. And so finding that line, finding that limit and trusting that even when we need to turn away, God will continue to see and mourn We need to know where that limit is. Um, and even when we wonder, okay, well, all I'm doing now is just praying. Like, is that enough? I'm sending my thoughts and prayers. Like, that's all I'm doing. Well, maybe in that season, that's what you need to do. Like, maybe you've absorbed enough. Maybe you've gone to enough protests. Maybe you've, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. Those are all really good things. I'm saying know your limit. I'm saying we're just people. We need to take care of ourselves. I think especially if you are part of a marginalized community, we are already holding so much just walking through our daily lives. You can't absorb everything all the time. It's okay to know your limit. You're not letting down your people. You're not letting down your ancestors. Just self-care is a real thing. And I know people are throwing that term around all the time now, but truly, Truly, find, figure out where that limit is and respect it and give yourself rest and know that while you are resting from that, God is still going around. Like, he's still doing his thing. Like, he doesn't need us to every day constantly be on our Instagram feed posting and watching and reading in order for him to continue working um, on the injustices that we're seeing. So, so find your peace will help you restore your hope and Get, get that sense of Habakkuk calm um, in your life. Um, and finally, Habakkuk tells us that he is able to find calm. He's able to transition from lament to hope because he knows that his strength does not come from him. So where does it come from? Verse 19 says, Elohim Adonai is my strength. God is his strength. And what does that strength look like? Dear feet. That is his answer. Dear feet. What? Okay. Um, it says in verse 19 also, he makes me swift and sure-footed as a deer and enables me to strive over, stride over my high places. Um, we don't see deer a ton around here. And so you might be like, oh, cute, Bambi, and kind of glaze over that last part. Like, God is my strength, great. Deer, feet, whatever, and kind of move on. But... Um, during the pandemic, so if you've heard me preach or have talked to me generally for like more than 10 minutes, you know, I like hiking and backpacking. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, my husband Justin and I went on this multi-day backpacking trip in Olympic National Park up in Washington State, um, 40 miles over five days, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not a very fast pace for backpacking. But they were really hard miles. I'm just saying, they were really hard miles. Um, it was August, but it's a temperate rainforest. And the west side of the valley actually receives 12 feet of rain every year. And it was just wet. So it was beautiful, right? So there's mountains and ferns and trees. But I was wet like the entire week. Like I was changing my socks and it didn't matter because nothing dried. And it was, just, it was just wet, right? So the whole trip, 
beautiful, so glad I went. It was a slog, just like the entire thing. The forest was thick because of all the rain, but it was hard to find trails sometimes, and there would be a few times where we'd be like, I think we can camp there. Oh, wait, that's just like wet ground, like soggy. Like, you know when you step on ground, it kind of goes, like, it's wet. So it's like, oh, we can't camp there. So it's just hard to find things because everything was just so hard to walk through. Uh, and we were just wet. Just wet. Anyway, so it was wet. Just, just If you take anything away from this conversation, Olympic National Forest is wet. Um, so, but one day we were on the trail and we rounded this corner and we just froze because up ahead were two of the largest animals I had ever seen in my life. And I've had like a grizzly walk into our campsite before. Not in California, there's no grizzlies in California. Um, they were elk, okay? Um, they're, I had to look it up, Roosevelt elk, because I am not an elk person. But they're like the largest elk in North America. They're over a thousand pounds, and it's August, so they they're mating season in September. So in August, their antlers are like, I mean, these are just like the biggest animals I have ever seen. Um, they were completely unbothered by us. They looked at us, and we're like, "You tiny creatures." Um, that's not what they said. They looked at us, and they turned and they walked up. I kid you not, like a steep mountain. They just walked straight up this mountain. Like in seconds, they just vanish. Slippery ferns, thick foliage, and somehow with their massive bodies and antlers, they just walked right through it, and in a matter of seconds, it was like they were never there. Like they just disappeared. And so when I read Elohim Adonai is my strength, he makes me swift and sure-footed as a deer and enables me to stride over my high places. That's what I think. I think Okay, sure-footed, unlikely to stumble. And even when, like if I had had to walk up that hill, that mountain steep area with all the ferns, I wouldn't have even thought to do it because it didn't just look impossible, like, oh, it's slippery and looks a little dicey. It looked impassable. Like there was no way to move through. It was too steep. It was too wet. It was too overgrown. It was impossible to move through. And that's often how I feel about the injustices of the world, right? The obstacles are too great, the injustices are too grave, the solutions are too hard, and God makes the way. So I'm willing to be a deer, if that's what God is going to make us, as sure-footed as the deer, because his hope will sustain us. He will make us sure-footed. He will make a way. It will continue to feel impossible and impassable if what we're leaning on is our own strength. It's just we cannot do it. But when we remember that it's God's strength that we lean on, that it's his strength that allows us to endure, it's his strength that we use to fight against and overcome injustice bit by bit until it's unmade and until it's taken down to its foundation, that's when it's possible to find hope. That's when it's possible to move from my legs are trembling to a sense of calm. Habakkuk's song of lament doesn't turn into hope because everything is suddenly fixed. That's not hope. His song of lament turned into a song of hope because he remembered God's deeds. Although he lived in fear and he burned with anger, he knows that God wants justice even more than he does. And he knew that God would give him strength. And so it turned into a song of hope hope for all that could be, the unmaking of oppressive systems, the birthing of liberation. And he has given us the gift of co-creating that with him, of being in the fight with him. And he's given us the responsibility of loving our neighbors so that when we seek justice and liberation, it's not just for ourselves, because that's not justice. And he has given us that responsibility. And then he has called us to do it together, us here in this room. He has called us in on video. He has called us to do it together. And his promise to us is not that it'll be quick or easy or simple, pain-free. His promise to us is that he will engage with us 
that he will answer us the way he answers the prophets, that he will be in conversation with us because he is not an idol. He is a God who listens to our prayers, a God who listens to our hurts and our angers, a God who hears the song of our hearts when we cry out for joy and he responds. He answers, he's with us in this and he wants it more than we do. Amen.